I have been in the hard landing camp and that just simply has not happened yet. It's very, very difficult to overcome this macro gravity, especially when the markets and economy fully appreciate what high, true higher for longer mean. Even a year from now, inflation is necessarily going to be anywhere close to that 2% target. I bet in a year from now, we could still have a 3% handle. Michael Cal, it is so great to welcome you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today, Michael. So excited to be with you. First time. I know. And I'm excited because I, I follow you on Twitter and I feel like you're always putting out incredible content. So folks should definitely go wa- go follow Urban Cowboy on Twitter. Well, Mike, <laughs> Thanks. I want to start where I always start with my guests. And I know there's a lot we'll get to in this conversation, but I want to start with the macro view, the big picture for you today. Uh, take as much time as you need to set the table, if you will, but that might frame up the conversation nicely if folks can kind of just hear you and your macro framework and view. So, okay. So maybe a couple of, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I wrote, maybe a couple of months ago now, I wrote this thread called The Four Horsemen of uh, U.S. Economic Resilience. And of course, paying homage to my favorite band, Metallica, right? So the four horsemen of, of economic resilience and inflation resilience, I should say, are, are as follows. One is there is a demographic and structural component to it where um, the if you think about what's sticky about inflation, the core core inflation is primarily labor and shelter. Um, I would start I would say that the oil, I, I believe oil is what started the inflation conflagration back in 2021. However, um, ex post, we, we know that there are some structural underlying factors that are kind of like the dry tinder. Oil was the spark. And so oil isn't really what's sustaining the current inflation. What's sustaining the current inflation, I believe, are sticky structural components with respect to labor and shelter. So in the with respect to labor, I noticed that when you go back to demographics, you notice that there's this kind of a, a, a shortage of workers in the age group of 45 to 59 which I would say is the the most highly tenured part of the workforce. And then at the same time, there is a bulge in the number of people that are aged 30 to 39, which I would say are the primary home buying household formation age, right? So it's almost like a perfect storm to me from a demographic perspective that that despite, you know, mortgage rates going from 3% to 8%, you've got still relatively resilient home prices. Um, while and then, and then this labor component is is has been uh, is very sticky and certainly it's you're seeing it um, manifested in newfound power to unions right you're seeing these strikes jump from industry to industry first Hollywood which I think the Hollywood strikes really had nothing to do with cost of living they had to do with streaming dynamics however. I think that emboldened other uh, unions across other industries to strike. And and now we've got, I think, the ingredients of kind of a wage price spiral happening. Okay, so so that's horseman number one. Horseman number two is the much touted fiscal tailwind. Fiscal tailwind, there's still we're still feeling the after effects of uh, the COVID fiscal stimulus, but way beyond that, okay, um, these three uh, bills that the current administration had passed, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, collectively earmark $2.2 trillion of spending over the next five to 10 years. And I did a uh, uh, search on how much of that has actually been spent to date. It's something like de minimis, like $60 billion or something. So there, so this is the ultimate vodka Red Bull economy. As the, as the Fed is trying to administer a monetary depressant. This the the fiscal Red Bull keeps getting poured on, and it's un, it's really negating the monetary depressant. Horseman number three is that the U.S. both the U.S. consumer and U.S. corporations are relatively uh, floating rate insensitive compared to the rest of the world, because when you look at the percentage of floating rate mortgages in the U.S. It's, it's the lowest in the world, I think. Um, and then 
with respect to corporate debt, of the sixteen trillion of corporate debt, I estimate uh, about three trillion of it to be floating rate. Um, so, so that's like less than twenty five percent. But I believe in Europe, it's seventy five percent. So that's horseman number three. Horseman number four is the issue of energy, relative energy independence, right? So. I put that in air quotes because I don't think energy independent U.S. energy independence is here forever. That's why I'm a long-term oil bull. However, um, in the sh- you know in the short term, we are relatively independent because the the U.S. is still the world's largest producer at 13 million barrels per day right now. Uh, you cannot say that for China, uh, who is naturally short oil, and certainly in Japan and in Europe, etc. So these four factors present a very uh, interesting dynamic, I think, where the Fed is really trying to get uh, uh, core inflation down back to two percent, but um, despite uh, you know all this conflicting data, like you know softening credit metrics, et cetera, well, we'll see. Inflation has remained relatively stubborn. Um, you're seeing the uh, when you when you see oil's recent softness and your and the softness in industrial metals across the board to me that is a canary in the a global canary in the coal mine that you're seeing the transmission effects of the fed be and, and through through the strong dollar mechanism um manifest itself globally but see the fed is going to be because of these four horsemen of resilience the fed is going to be forced to stay tighter than the rest of the other central banks. That's my belief. And I think that's going to make the dollar continue to spike because it's not a question of whether the Fed's going to outdove the rest of the world anymore. It's a question of whether the rest of the world is going to start, is going to start outdoving the Fed. So that's my, that's my top-down thesis. <laughs> I love that. That was incredible. I, I took so many notes. I like this notion of like a red, uh, vodka Red Bull economy with the fiscal <laughs> Red Bull negating the uh, that monetary depressant of the vodka. Great analogy. Okay, there are a lot of areas I would love to just dive in and explore with you. So um, I guess my first one, and I have a few I want to go with, is this notion, okay, the, the vodka Red Bull economy then. So do you think all of this like these four horsemen, is that going to like delay a recession? I want to hear your thoughts on like maybe more of a recess- recessionary outlook. Um, what are your views there? Um, so I'll just let you, I don't know if you want to say if you're in hard landing, soft yeah. landing or whatnot. I, but I do have, I am curious about that. Does this delay that? Well, I think, yeah. So, so I think like a lot of people, I have, I have been surprised at the economic resilience so far and the delayed onset of the recession. I have been in the hard landing camp and that just simply has not happened yet. The reason why I say yet and the reason why I still think eventually the hard landing comes is I think eventually, I I call this, you know, it's very, very difficult to overcome this macro gravity, uh, especially when the markets and economy fully appreciate what high, true higher for longer means, right? So um, we saw this recent bear steepening in the yield curve, and that's partially due to, I think, you know, this recognition that wow, you know what? Um, the you know when you look at the yield curve, I, what I, I find it kind of interesting that the the markets and and certainly mainstream media they always tend to treat the yield curve as if it's some sort of omniscient asset class that's uh, that's uh, immune to the recency biases that all other asset classes are subject to. And I always say that, look, if you look at the yield curve and what it's been pricing in over the last two years, it's been consistently wrong um, in, in especially estimating the uh, return of uh, e- the easing cycle, right? I mean, so 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 if you so you, you keep this this higher for longer um, uh, notion keeps getting pushed out and even even right now I'm I'm of the opinion that the rate eases that are being priced in to uh, next you know I think in in the first or second quarter of next year I think that's just way too optimistic I don't think that 
even a year from now, um, inflation is necessarily going to be uh, at the anywhere close to that 2% target. I, I, I bet in a year from now, we could still have a 3% handle. Um, and, you know, the one of the things, you know, I, I'm, even though I'm a long-term oil bull and I've expressed it through a, a long-term oil private equity position, in the short term, I'm very concerned because I think, again, when you look at global commodities, it, you know, the, you, the, because of what the Fed is doing and because of U.S. relative economic resilience, the Fed is going, I think, will wind up breaking other countries first um, through the strong dollar mechanism. You see? Yeah. <clears throat> I want to um, tease that out first. By the way, I feel like vodka Red Bull hangover would probably be horrible. So maybe there's another analogy in there as well. <laughs> um I want to tease out this dollar wrecking ball. Um, I know you've talked a lot about that. Can you frame that up and help the folks who are watching and listening um, understand this mechanism, the implications of that stronger dollar? Well, because the dollar is um, so embedded into the uh, world economy, just by virtue of it being the you know, the global reserve currency and counting for over 90% of FX transactions, 60% of central bank reserves. I mean, it, it's the denominator for everything, right? And most importantly, it's the denominator for denominator for what I call OPEX commodities, right? Commodities that are, yeah, I, I kind of differentiate the commodity world between sort of CapEx and OPEX commodities, but I focus on oil the most because it is the most important OPEX commodity. It's a it's a commodity that has to be consumed all of the time, as opposed to you know sort of discretionary CapEx commodities that that are fueled by you know investment growth CapEx cycles, right? Um, um, oh, so so but because that all important uh, OPEX commodity is denominated in dollars. Think about what's happening. A lot, a lot of people think that um, you know demand is just going to keep holding up here. But when you look at the impact of strong oil and strong dollar, the that double whammy. It's a twin wrecking ball, right? Especially to the countries of Asia, where they're naturally short these commodities. You're, if you look at Japan or you look at China. The, given the depreciation in their respective currencies, um, that that is definitely going is causing demand destruction. And so the reason why I think that the I'm I'm still kind of perplexed why the uh, euro has actually held up relatively well. Um, and I think that the only reason why the DXY, for instance, is at 105 and a half as opposed to 115. Is because the of the euro's uh, very large weight in the DXY. The euro is actually hiding the dollar wrecking ball. I, I say I like to say that the dollar wrecking ball is hiding in plain sight. It's very very evident in Asia. It's not that evident yet when you look at the DXY, and that's primarily because the euro is still hanging on, and people still kind of give the ECB some sort of. Uh, credulity that they're going to somehow keep pace with the Fed when I think they cannot. I think that when you look at the uh, economies of uh, Europe, they're falling apart a lot faster than, than, than here. Hey there, I just want to quickly interrupt the video and just say thank you. Thank you so much for coming to this channel and choosing to watch this interview. I hope that you are enjoying it and I appreciate you visiting the channel. If you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything. It's totally free and it will keep you up to date on all of my interviews. I post two interviews a week with some of the most incredible people in, in finance and investing and your support will help me bring in some more amazing guests. If you already are one of my subscribers, thank you so much. I cannot express to you how much your support means to me. I am incredibly grateful that I get to do something that I'm truly passionate about. And you being there week after week, it not only gives me that energy, but 
it just gives me that faith to keep going. And it means everything to me. And I love seeing you all in the comments section. I love interacting with you. I love interacting with you on email or social media. I just love hearing from you all. And I just appreciate your support so much. I feel incredibly lucky that I get to do something that I just love. So I just want to say thank you and appreciate you subscribing. All right, back to the interview. Okay. And also this notion too, uh, um, again, so amazing to have you on because I'm learning a lot in this process and I know other folks are too. Um, Talking about, you know, the rest of the world out out dubbing um, the Fed while the Feds have remained hawkish. Can we kind of... um, understand what does that, mean? that or- yeah well I, yeah well, i kind of get what it means but maybe okay i'll yeah. let you explain what it means but also the implications there well i mean look at, at at its very basic level fx uh currencies are driven by relative interest rate differentials right and so what i so the first phase of the us dollar wrecking ball which was last year where you know we we saw dxy crest 115 that was clearly a situation where the Fed was out hawking the rest of the world. The Fed was most aggressive uh, in in hiking, and everybody else had to follow suit. Right, so that widening diff- interest rate differential between you know U.S. risk free rates and risk free rates in other parts of the world was was led by the Fed out hawking the rest of the world. Right, so so then we had this uh, this uh, sell off in the dollar, uh, and you know there you know there a lot of uh, you. you a lot of people thought, oh, you know, the the Fed's going to pivot soon, and blah blah blah, and and so you saw a pretty sharp dollar correction. A lot of people uh, thought that uh, th- this was going to be the the cyclical top in the dollar, and I said, not so fast, because like, even then, before long before I wrote this horse four horseman thread, I, I I saw that it's it seemed like. The U.S. economy was doing a lot better than most of the world, and so it, it, the the I I think phase two of the dollar wrecking ball is going to be driven by again this this notion that the Fed simp- the Fed simply has not been uh, given a true dilemma yet between its dual mandate here in, here in the United States, right? It's it, it's essentially focused on the inflation fight, and it hasn't had to make any real hard choices yet with unemployment still below four um, percent. And um, as long as unemployment is still so low here, you're not going to really see the slowdown in aggregate demand that this monetary depressant is meant to create. And and so. Um, but the re- but you can't say the same thing for the rest of the world. Again, when you look at these four horsemen of resilience, right? The only horsemen that I would say that maybe the economies of Western Europe somewhat share are some of these demographic elements. Because interestingly, after World War II, uh, when Japan had had a baby bust, and we here uh, the Western economies had a baby boom. The demographic trends in the wet in the uh, uh, allied countries essentially followed the same kind of pattern. You had a baby boom followed by a a, a much smaller sort of uh, Gen X. I'm I'm Gen X, and then so so the, the demographic trends are c- kind of similar. So that I would say that that's the only um, uh, horseman of the first of the four that I listed that is maybe shared with some of the countries in Europe, but no other country has all other three right I, we talked about the the rate insensitivity we talked certainly from a, the biggest horseman of all i think is this disparity between the fiscal tailwind here versus what other countries have done i yeah. mean we are yeah 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 it's oh, again fascinating um one uh, uh, before i get into like portfolio construction i want to ask just one follow-on on oil and you're mentioning um again i'm looking at my notes the recent softness in oil and industrial metals being a global canary in the coal mine. Um, but yeah, you're also, a, um, I guess, longer term bull on oil. Can we just um, hear more of your views on oil? Yeah. So <clears throat> I have had, you know, I, I've had this long term oil bet on since 2018. Okay. And the whole bet, I mean, the oil bulls will know 
the, this whole idea of when I, I, I had this term that I, that I coined, um, maybe two years ago, I call it the, the oil supply demand singularity, which is, which I define as there will come a point in time because of the lack of long-term investment in conventional projects. You know, the world has gotten, uh, sort of drunk off of, uh, the U S shale revolution being able to patch the holes, uh, from this dearth of long-term investment that um, there will come a point in time or there might come a point in time where even a uh, sort of uh, recession impacted demand level will exceed all global spare capacity. And that's the point where, you know what, the, the supply curve becomes completely inelastic and oil prices can have a flyaway scenario. Right. That is my sort of that's that was that's been my long term thesis in oil since 2018. I've chosen, though, to express it through a long term private equity bet that is a self liquidating duration shortening bet. We can talk about that a little bit later, but but that's how I've expressed it. So that way I don't get shaken out of, of shorter term macroeconomic cycles. The current one being exactly my point, because I think. In the short term, meaning this, you know, the it, certainly I've been bearish. I've, I've been bearish. I turned bearish on oil since April of 2022. That has been largely the right call. I missed this spike between July to recently, but I'm very concerned that, see, ultimately the, the cure for high prices is high prices. And when you have a twin wrecking ball of a strong dollar and oil prices, you're going to have a big problem. Um, I my introduction to the hedge fund industry was the doorstep of the Asian crisis of 1998, and I remember very very clearly uh, what that did to oil demand. And it's not just about. I wrote a thread back in April of 22 when I first turned bearish, and saying that look, it's not even during the Great Financial Crisis of 2008 when oil demand actually went down. Uh, uh, year over year by like a half a million barrels per day, that that was enough to send oil crashing down. And the reason why is because it's not just the demand impact going down. It's take the, the, the oil markets constantly have this built-in sort of growth in demand forecast of, you know, call it like, you know, a million to two million barrels per day per year, right? So when, when you have a recessionary situation, you can take, you can kiss that growth goodbye, and then actually, if the recession is severe enough, you actually see a shrinkage of demand. So the delta to expectations um, could actually be as high as two and a half to three million barrels per day. And for a for a commodity that's priced to the marginal barrel, that's that could be significant enough to to really crash prices. I mean, we saw it during the GFC. We saw it nineteen ninety eight. We certainly saw it during COVID. And then there's also like a geopolitical uh, dynamic. Uh, you know, the conventional wisdom here, I don't know if you want to go here, but, you know, the conventional wisdom uh, is that when this is uh, Israel Hamas uh, war started, that, oh my gosh, you know, it's, uh, you know, Middle East instability, oil's going to 150. And I said, you know, wait a second, I actually have a very contrarian opinion. I think the geopolitical risk to oil is actually to the downside because if you think about <clears throat> what has sustained oil prices even at current levels, it's been unilateral cuts from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. MBS has essentially removed 3 million barrels per day from Saudi's uh, uh, production capacity. Global spare capacity, I'm probably on the high side. I think it's closer to 6 to 7 million. I, I think the the uh, the most bullish of people would even acknowledge that it's probably like three and a half million barrels per day. It's a lot. So this is not a 1973 scenario where we we didn't know where the next molecule was coming. There's a lot of sort of built-in supply uh, el elasticity uh, that's being artificially held back. And the reason why I think that the geopolitical wild card is to the downside is that last week. Saudi Arabia was in DC and I and I put out a tweet. I said, you gotta watch this because NBS is kind of like Lord Baelish 
Remember Littlefinger from Game of Thrones? He is he is he's incredibly good at playing all sides against one another, and it's no it's no secret that um, Saudi Arabia and Iran have been traditional rivals forever, and so. At the same time, MBS has no exit strategy from his unilateral cuts of 3 million barrels per day. He's been subsidizing cheaters like UAE and Russia. So wouldn't it be interesting if, 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 there, if the US is concerned about Iran getting embroiled into a kinetic escalation here uh, and or the US is concerned about uh, being forced to uh, re uh, reinstitute uh, reinforce sanctions on Iran, um, wouldn't it be interesting for MBS to step in as the good guy and say, "Hey, in exchange for some sort of security deal with the U.S., I will flood the market with oil, just like he did in Q4 of 2018 when." When Trump pulled us out of JCPOA, assured the world that there would be no waivers, begged MBS to flood the market, which he did, and then all of a sudden Trump rug pulled the market and said, "I'm going to grant waivers anyways," and then the, the oil market collapsed. So, so um, it's a it's a non-zero probability, I think, um, much higher than a non-zero probability. Yeah. Well, we've discussed like your macro framework. I do want to get into a bit of portfolio construction because you've had some interesting pieces come out, including one on duration and looking at this concept of duration for all asset classes. And I understand that you're favoring shorter duration assets versus the long term. Can you kind of, well, one, maybe we should even level set and frame up duration for the folks, but I do want to hear more on this and this thesis around shorter duration. Yeah, I you know I'm actually writing this uh, thread that I'm going to put out this weekend that that really delves into this issue. But I, I did write one I think last year or two years ago, trying to explain the idea that the way I use the the, the term duration is a very broad in a, in a very broad conceptual framework because I used to be a capital structure arbitrageur. To me. Um, the securities within up and down a capital stack, right? Run a con- it's a continuum. Oh, so so the 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 terms bond and stocks are essentially artificial delimiters within the uh, within the capital structure. All they are are simply bundles of cash flows bundled different ways, right? So in a bond, you've got structurally stipulated coupons and principal payments, whereas with equities, they're not structurally stipulated. Um, and you can price these securities by discounted cash flows, right? And so the concept of duration, the way I use it, has to do with if you think about these bundles of cash flows as kind of like a lever, right? Um, if all of the value is in the far out terminal value, what I call sort of the on the come value, as opposed to current cash flows. That's a long duration asset. And a long duration asset is very, very sensitive to movements and in interest rates. <clears throat> a short duration asset is exactly the opposite, where let's say you have a, an asset that is generating a lot of cash flow right now. There's a, a, the relative weighting of value within that DCF is much more on the current cash flow versus the on the come terminal value. Those assets are much more resilient to a higher for longer type of environment. So when you witness what we just saw in the in the bear steepening uh, situation, I think a lot of people did not forecast the bear steepener because if you look at, ju- if you just consider the history of the last, you know, 20 some odd years, right, where every single um, recession was curable with uh, an instant sort of ZERP policy and QE, well, you know, that that that's why I think we had, you know, the this automatic notion that, you know, the yield curve is going to uh, invert massively uh, right before like a recession. But if you look way beyond that and you go back to the experience of the 70s, for instance, 
you actually saw these bear steepenings happen where you had the Fed <clears throat> aggressively raise the short end. And then after a period of time, the long end adjusts, realizing that the Fed is going to stay higher for longer. And so <clears throat> in um, I did this uh, uh, thread a couple of weeks ago. I called it something like, you know, the, the bear re- revisiting bear steepenings in that 70s show. And I showed this yield curve to show like the, the recent bear steepening in relation to what happened in 79, 80, 81, and 82. And all of a sudden, this massive bear steepening that everybody was telling you about, it just, it looks so small compared to what happened in, in the, in the, in the 70s, in the late 70s. And I'll further, I'll, I'll end by saying that what's kind of scary is that, again, the reason why I think this higher for longer situation is, uh, is, uh, going to surprise people is that because of these structural underpinnings that we opened this discussion with, I don't think the Fed is going to be able to cure a recession with a quick return to ZERP this time. Because if he does, if if they do, I think the the structural underpinnings of that inflation are still there. That dry tinder just gets relit. And so and so so in the in the seventies, you saw this happen. You saw that that once the zeitgeist changed and inflation expectations got embedded into the market, do you know what happened in eighty two when the Fed finally started easing because of the severe recession? The back end of the market completely blew out in yield. So so you had three you, you had basically three years of like fed aggressive fed hikes from 79 80 to 81 followed by bear steepenings and then by 82 the fed started easing and then there was a severe bull steepener where the back end blew out even more because that that was the, that was the market saying you know what we have we no longer have confidence that you can contain this inflation change. and i'm seeing I'm seeing some of the ingredients being set up now because as we talked about strikes, right? These strikes, uh, the last two FOMCs, I was looking for any hint of the Fed acknowledging the importance of these strikes, not a, not a peep. And I find that to be somewhat shocking because to me, you know, you're seeing the UAW uh, basically coax 25% wage increases. You're seeing, um, you know, uh, pilots. Uh, get forty percent uh, wage increases even without striking. These are structurally um, negotiated, you know, price hikes. And what do you think that's going to do to to the you know the prices of finished goods and services ultimately? So I, it's a problem. Yeah. Well, and inflation will be persistent in that scenario. Um, I also saw, and, and I was kind of listening to you there, like this notion too of like starting to think about stocks as bonds and that yeah. goes back to duration can you explain that because that was really interesting yeah to yeah me. yeah I, I i had an interesting exchange with uh with bob elliott because i saw he, he had this great quote he said that yeah at some point you know um uh people are going to realize that there are there are bonds in their stocks and i and that's when i uh i i echoed i said a hundred percent and i and i talked about this notion that the capital structure is a continuum because again um I, I, I'm working on this thread this weekend, so so please look for it. Um, it's it's talking about when you when you actually boil down the path and you look at like what a, what what a, a DCF mathematically looks like for a bond versus a stock. They're almost identical equations. It's the 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 difference is that you know the 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 cash flows that that you're discounting for a stock uh, are replaced by coupon. Stru- uh, uh, you know, structurally uh, stipulated coupon payments in a bond, and then the terminal value component of a stock DCF can be replaced by the by the um, structurally stipulated principal payment in a bond. But everything else is exactly the same. Now, there's there are differences in lingo, right? The discount rate um, in a bond is broken up between the risk free rate and what we call the credit spread. And the discount rate in an equity is broken up between the risk-free rate and the market and the equity risk premium. It, but but this is all like you know financial people making up lingo to make themselves sound smarter. It's all the same thing. 
That's that's my point. And so there definitely are bonds in stocks because it's they're essentially the same thing. It's it's all part of a, a, a continuum. I want to get in a question about a piece that you wrote, um, and you haven't really been asked about it a lot. So I want to bring this up because I th- do think it is important, and that's exit strategies. Can you explain that uh, and yes, when to get yes. out, when to add, when to hodl, if you will? Yeah. So I, I okay. So this is this actually dovetails really nicely into the discussion of sh- uh, short duration versus long duration assets because I uh, I wrote this uh, this piece on investing and and the importance of exit strategies. And this, I think like two years ago, and I basically said, look, there, I, it's it's very easy, I think, to bot for anybody to identify. Uh, a good entry point into anything. If something is cheap or whatever, it's, but it's much, much harder to identify when you get out of a profitable trade or when to cut losses on a on a you know uh, you know not profitable trade. Right. So the exit strategy, I think, is absolutely key. And this is actually a a a, a fundamental question I've wrestled with my entire career. And I built my career primarily doing uh, convertible arbitrage and event-driven strategies. So the reason why is because in those strategies, the exit strategy is already predetermined. So let me explain. If you are <clears throat> in that piece that you referenced, um, I kind of broke down four different types of exit strategies. One is what I call replicating portfolio, where if you're uh, buying a convertible bond or an option and you dynamically hedge the underlying, okay, you don't, you're not incumbent on the greater fool to come in and take you out at a higher price. You can, through, through dynamic replication of the portfolio and dynamic hedging, if you're buying cheap ball, you can monetize that by, by creating a replicating portfolio and dynamically hedging. That's what I mean by a replicating, creating a replicating portfolio. And that's why, that's what makes a strategy like convertible arbitrage or volatility arbitrage, options arbitrage interesting because you're not incumbent on the greater fool to take you out. Event dra- event driven strategies are like, uh, like risk arbitrage, for instance, right? If you have, uh, if there is a predetermined deal where uh, company Y is buying out company X, well, um, if you buy company X and short company Y, as long as that deal happens, you're going to get, make that spread. Your your exit strategy is predetermined. I will add, I I will further add that if you buy any sort of bond, any sort of uh, uh, strategy that's positive carry, that's really an event driven strategy because the receipt of every coupon and the eventual receipt of the principal is an event also. It's a risk arb if you think about it. Every single coupon is an event with a predetermined exit because cash is coming into your pocket. Okay. So those two strategies have predetermined exits and make life a lot easier. (laughs) All you have to decide is when to buy in, right? The greater full strategies are much harder, right? Greater full strategies are where I, and I break them up into two different categories. There's greater full based on fundamentals, greater full based on just pure technicals. Greater full on fundamentals is your standard, you know, if buy if if you buy a stock you think that you think is cheap and you think is you've done the fundamental homework, um, you ultimately though to make money, you still need the quote greater full. And I'm not using the greater full in a pejorative sense. What I mean by the greater full is you need somebody to pay a higher price to take you out at a profit. That's the, that's what I term as the greater fool, right? But at least if, if you, if you're, you've done your homework from a intrinsic value, fundamental perspective, when a greater fool trade goes against you, you have the conviction to stay with it. The fourth category that I wrote about in that thread is the greater fool backed only by technicals where Let's say you're in an asset like Bitcoin or gold or something or a Birkin bag where you you just there's no fun there's no DCF model for it. At, at the uh, or you're talking about fine wine or fine art or an NFT. 
there's no way to fundamentally value that asset. And so value is truly only in the eye of the beholder, the greater fool beholder. So in a situation like that, to me, it's much harder to have conviction when the trade goes against you because you're just, there, there's no, there's no uh, notion of intrinsic value. So, so when I talk about like right now, the way I am positioning my book because of this short duration, long duration thesis, I, I think that, you know, to, to kind of put a bow in this conversation, we started with this conversation with why I think that, um, there are various factors that are going to cause the Fed to stay higher for longer, mainly because of you know, U.S. relative resilience. Well, what does that then mean? I think that means that there will higher for longer ultimately will favor shorter duration assets over longer duration. So then from a portfolio construction standpoint, an exit strategy standpoint, for me, I want to have uh, names that, that are ideally have have built in exit strategies where, for instance, I'm getting paid to wait or the cash flow is coming to me um, and and I want to be short strat, uh, assets that are who, whose values are very reliant on the on-the-come value, the terminal value, right? So when you think about the high multiples that the Magnificent Seven, for instance, are sporting. Well, I think everybody, regardless of the quality of company or the quality of franchise, eventually succumbs to macro gravity. And when you've got these these crazy multiple crazy multiples, by definition, that means that a lot a large preponderance of the value of these stocks is embedded in the on the come component. The the terminal value component as opposed to current cash flow component. Does that make sense? Yeah, it that's, does. That's how, I'm, that's how I'm thinking about the world. It does. And it does put a nice bow on it. Uh, Michael, <laughs> I want to give you a few moments. Um, let folks know where they can follow you on social media, uh, read your sub, your sub stack, hey. and any parting thoughts uh, for the folks who are watching and listening. Well, thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, uh, my, I'm Urban Cowboy with a K A O uh, on Twitter, and then uh, UrbanCowboy.com is my Substack. And like I said, I, I'm I'm writing this uh, thread on mental models, uh, where I'm going to try to to dispel the hard math of valuing various asset classes uh, in this thread. So I'll, I'll drop that this weekend. I love it. Well, we'll definitely be looking out for it. Michael Cowell, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your ideas. Really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Yeah, it was really enjoyable. Thank you.